Yeah. Thank you. I can't really think of a link with Ben's talk, so I'm not really going to try it's something completely different, shall we say that. Um, I'm very happy to be contacted. I get contacted a lot by that particular, you know, worrying patients from all over um, the country. I'm very happy um, to advise. Um, I'm also on Twitter. I like Twitter. Um, anyway, I'm going to tell you about um, autoimmune encephalitis. So this is this new disorder over the last decade or so that really, um, it's not sort of overstating it to say, has revolutionised neurological practice um, across the world, really. So it's recognised as a cause of a serious, treatable uh, neuropsychiatric disorder. Um, and tell you why it's important for you all to know about it. Um, so the presentation is with psychosis, with severe treatment-resistant psychosis. So a lot of the kind of people that you see on your PICUs. Um, I'll tell you a bit about our research looking um, for these same antibodies in uh, patients with purely primary psychiatric diagnoses. And I'll tell you a bit about what I think you should be doing um, when you go back to your clinical practices. So these new disorders um, have really only... Um, exploded in the last decade or so, but the first description um, was here, was in the Lancet, I think 20 odd years ago, and I, I put it down there just to show that even in the first descriptions, they were pretty psychiatric in their presentations. These weren't um, patients that were immediately recognisable as having a neurological disorder and went straight to the neurologist for treatment. They start off in psychiatric wards, usually, and intensive care units, usually. So this was a, a young girl, gradually lost contact with reality, became confused, transferred to a psychiatric unit, had a stiff facial expression, incoherent thoughts, and was dismissive. We couldn't communicate with her at all. They found a mass palpated in the lower abdomen, neurological examination unremarkable. So the mass was an ovarian teratoma that is associated with um, with these antibodies in particular. And the reason why um, these have been such a game changer for neurologists, uh, I mean, antibodies have been associated with neurological disorders for, you know, decades and decades, but these antibodies are different. So they stick to the surface of the neurons and they directly cause the underlying clinical presentation. And because they're sticking to the surface of the neurons, you can relatively easily detach them again. So getting rid of the antibodies actually treats the clinical presentation and um, the patient gets, the be gets better, but often very dramatically so. So that's why it's so vitally important to diagnose them and to then put the appropriate treatment in place um, to get rid of them. This slide just shows how we test for these antibodies. So you need to get a sample, uh, a blood sample or a CSF sample from the patient, and then we put the... Um, the sample across cells on the bottom right hand corner there and these cells express only the particular receptor that you're interested in. So if you see them lighting up, you put a sort of immunofluorescent dye on it, if you see the, the cell lighting up, the only thing that can be present in that patient's sample is antibodies against that particular um, target. So it's a really specific test, so there's no doubt when you get a positive test result back, this patient has antibodies against that, um, against that antigen. Um, the bottom left is just showing that it's sticking to the neuronal cell surface. It looks like a nice kind of dotty kind of pattern. And the top slide just shows that they preferentially tend to stick to the sort of hippocampus, so the sort of the bits that are important for memory, um, memory consolidation, um, uh, and that's why there are often prominent symptoms that we see. Okay, so this slide shows the number of antibodies that have now been described. So um, neurological researchers are very busy trying to identify rarer and rarer sets of patients. They all tend to present in roughly the same kind of way with these kind of florid encephalitis kind of presentations. So seizures, memory problems, but also in almost all of them, psychiatric kind of presentations as well. So psychosis, um, mood disorders, sleep problems, um, and uh, yeah, and rapid rapid memory um, problems often as well. And you can you can recognise the receptors there. You know, 
we recognise from a sort of psychiatric mental health point of view, these receptors are vitally important for, um, in our disorders as well. And the big one in bold, though, is the NMDA receptor antibody. That's the one that you know, outnumbers all the others added together, really, and that's the really important one that you know about, and I'll tell you um, some more detail about that one. Okay, so NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis, which is a complete mouthful, um, but you may have heard of it. It's been made into a film. A New York um, Post journalist, Susanna Cahalan, had this disorder, and she made the film called Brain on Fire. It was a bit of a crap film, but she did a lot of, you know, she went around Oprah and all sorts of chat shows and stuff, and so she's really raised the profile of this disorder, particularly in the States. Um, so there's a lot of um, demand for people to be tested for these antibodies. The description was originally in um, a group of young girls with ovarian teratomas and this rapidly progressive encephalitis. So over a period of a couple of weeks, they went from being completely well to being pretty moribund, semi-conscious, with a classical dystonic movement disorder, sort of jaw writhing, lip smacking kind of what we might call tardive dyskinesia kind of appearance. Um, they would also have seizures. They would also have prominent um, autonomic instability. So their blood pressure and their breathing would be all over the place. Um, and then they would progress to um, developing a life-threatening um, uh, situation, primarily because of the autonomic instability. Um, before this disorder was um, diagnosed and treated, patients would often die or be left severely disabled um, in about a quarter of a third of cases. Since that initial description, really the numbers have broadened out. It's no longer just young women that we see this disorder in. Um, you can see the age range is there, and it's, you know, it's, it's men as well. And it's actually pretty unusual that we find an ovarian teratoma now. It's the minority of patients that have a teratoma. Most of them um, do not. And this disorder is recognised across the world. It accounts for 1% of all admissions to medical intensive care units. Okay, this is just showing in sort of another schematic the progression of the symptoms that you see. So as I said, it's over a couple of weeks people progress from um, the initial presentation to being on the intensive care unit with life-threatening autonomic instability. But you'll see at the beginning the initial presentation in three quarters of cases is psychiatric. People present with um, psychosis primarily. So this is why it's so important for all mental health professionals to be conscious and aware of this disorder because the potential for the early detection and diagnosis before you get to the life-threatening situation is with you. And if patients aren't picked up, then I'm, I'm afraid I do get asked to advise on serious incidents where patients have, are found to have died in um, inpatient settings because of undiagnosed encephalitis. You diagnose the patients by, as I say, taking the blood test or ideally by taking uh, a lung puncture and looking in the CSF. If you look in the CSF in, the first, in those first few weeks, you will see inflammation and you will see the antibodies are there. And that's the sort of diagnosis there, you know, that, that is enough to, um, to treat people. But that's what you need to do. Okay, this was a nice paper. This was um, my PhD student, Adam Aldamani. He looked back at these um, neurological disorders, these neurological cases of NMDA receptor encephalitis, and it's probably a bit smaller, but I'll talk you through it. And he looked at the psychiatric symptoms that people presented with. So that's 77% of patients that present to psychiatrists. What do they look like? You know, and the caveat to this is that this is as described by neurologists. So as we know, that they're pretty limited in their, you know, ability to describe the psychopathology. And particularly, for instance, um, in the symptoms of catatonia, we know that clinicians are pretty poor at actually recognising catatonia when it's there. But you'll see that patients present with a broadly a sort of behavioural phenotype. So a lot of agitation, aggression, violence, disinhibition, um, impul impulsivity. Um, so all the kind of people that you recognise with the um, sort of explosive, kind of aggressive, um, psychotic presentation. Two-thirds of them will have positive 
um, psychotic symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, grandiosity. Um, and then you'll see a range of other symptoms there. So about half will have uh, affective symptoms. About a third will have um, prominent catatonia, waxy flexibility, posturing. So, uh, um, you know, I'm sure you're thinking of people that you recognize yourself, these kind of acute presentations are very floridly unwell with a mixture of psychotic symptomatology. Um, and this is all um, in the first couple of weeks of this disorder. It's worth noting that pretty rare presentations at the bottom there of actually presentations with eating um, difficulties, hypophagia or hyperphagia, and also um, rarely new onset OCD. So it's not clear cut. Um, the point I like to make to neurologists as much as to psychiatrists is that we've known since the beginning of time, actually, that all these symptoms that are described in autoimmune encephalitis have been recognized as part and parcel of schizophrenia as described from Kraepelin onwards. So we think of it as a disorder of positive and negative symptoms, maybe with catatonia, but actually there's an association with seizures, there's prominent cognitive um, dysfunction that we've um, described carefully over many decades. If you look for movement disorder, even in unmedicated populations, you see a significant number of um, people with a movement disorder. And what you know, neurologists call catastrophic autonomic dysfunction, we might call neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's a matter of nomenclature. It's a matter of us seeing things from a different direction. We don't look in the CSF, we don't do lumbar punctures, but if you did, and they do in Germany, they find inflammation in a proportion of patients. They find the same lymphocytes, oligoclonal bands, markers of CNS inflammation in the first episode, in the beginning of psychosis. So it's there. I, I would say the clues are there and have been all along. Okay. So this is this critical slide, which is um, it, taken from um, Swasharani's brain paper to show why this matters. So this is, these are 400 odd patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis who are given treatment or not. And IT is immunotherapy. So the treatments for this disorder are high dose steroids, they're intravenous immunoglobulins, which are like, um, human um, blood product of um, antibodies taken from blood donations, or plasma exchange, which is a kind of a plumbing intervention where you filter out people's um, plasma, which contains the antibodies, and put it back into their body. So a completely mechanical treatment. So if you give immunotherapy in less than about six weeks, you see an improvement in their MRS, which is the modified ranking scale of about three points. Now that doesn't sound like a lot of points, but the MRS is like the whole of life compressed into six points. So a zero on an MRS is completely well, back at work, symptom free, and a six on an MRS is dead. So a change of three points on an MRS is a difference between being in long-term institutional care and being back at home with your family. It is dramatic um, as that. And that's why there have never been any randomized controlled trials of these treatments. It's just accepted by neurologists that you just need to treat people quickly. They also treat people quite aggressively even though the data doesn't seem to show it matters really much what you do. So give steroids or give steroids plus something else, they both seem to help. But um, anyway, but um, neurologists have their protocols of how to treat these disorders. Okay, so my research over the last five years has been coming from a different direction, saying how many of the people that I see in my first episode of psychosis service without these other frank encephalopathic signs also have these antibodies and therefore that might be relevant for their illness. And that's what we did. We screened across England. Thank you to anybody that's helped recruit this study. We're actually still recruiting. Um, we looked at people right at the beginning of their illness um, and just we screened for the antibodies. It was very simple. We had a control population that were largely students in Cambridge, so you can argue how normal they were, but they were, you know, they were age, gender, and ethnicity matched, and they didn't have psychosis. This is what we found. We found overall that 8.8% um, of patients with first episode psychosis had one or other antibody, 
Actually, we found some controls also had antibodies, which was the first time that had been described. But the ones where we found antibodies in patients and not in controls, particularly were with the NMDA receptor antibodies. We found 3% of patients um, had these antibodies, so a small proportion. If you take our data together with other studies across the world that have looked at this, we seem to find that there's a signal if you look at the beginning of illness. So if you look at people with first episode acute psychosis, you see antibodies with an odds ratio of six. If you look at people with long-standing illness, people with other diagnoses, you don't tend to see them. And the relevance of that is that it's really not much point in testing someone that has a 20-year history of schizophrenia for these antibodies. Because A, you're likely to see something, and B, it's, there's no real evidence basis to what you're going to do about it if you happen to find the antibodies. Okay, so, so what? Did our patients that we tested for antibodies actually look any different? Did they have different clinical presentations? Were they a bit more encephalopathic, basically? We found that the patients with antibodies had a really abrupt onset to their illness. They had a mean duration of untreated psychosis of a week. But some patients without antibodies also had an abrupt onset to their illness, so it wasn't discriminatory in itself. But it was a bit of a clue, I think, that there, there might be something relevant, the antibodies are doing something relevant to those patients. But we did um, psychosis measures, we did general functioning measures, we did catatonia measures, no difference clinically. So the person sitting in front of you, you could not say, you are more psychotic, you're more likely to have an antibody. And not more cognitively impaired. Actually, most people with psychosis are cognitively impaired. This is the Adam Brooks Cognitive Examination, just to show that most are below the threshold for what you call dementia, in the, each domain of an ACE. But no difference if you have an antibody or not. But we followed people up for six months. If you have an antibody, you're much less likely to get better. So this is the rate of remission in people with antibodies and people without antibodies. So we know that about two thirds, or 70% of patients in general with a first episode of psychosis get better from their first episode with antipsychotics. But it's only 18% if you've got an antibody. So again, that's a real clue. If you get somebody that just does not respond, then it's worth just thinking, is this relevant? Okay, but the million dollar question really is so what, isn't it? Do patients with psychosis and antibodies actually get better with immunotherapy with these completely different kind of treatment approaches? And that's what we've been doing clinically over the last few years. I run a clinic with neuroimmunologists. We treat people on clinical grounds. So if somebody comes to us, they have an antibody, they have a treatment resistant illness, they're well able to make a uh, capacitous decision about uh, you know, having these different kinds of treatments, we will offer them exactly the same treatment regime as if they presented with a neurological presentation. And I put our data rather provocatively alongside Sirosh Rani's data. So I converted our outcomes into MRS. So but because patients don't tend to be more abundant on intensive care units, they start at a lower level but actually they respond to treatment in exactly the same way. They will get better with, in, with these different treatment approaches, and if you don't give them immunotherapy, they tend to not get better. Of course, these are open-label treatments. It's not blinded, it's not randomized. The reason people get treatment, it, you know, they're different kind of patients to patients, patients that don't get treatment. So there's that you know, caution about it, but I would say that's exactly the same with the neurological patients as well. Okay, I wanted to share this study with you as well, because it's, um, I think, directly relevant to you. This is from James Scott in Queensland, and he screened 113 inpatients in, um, over a period of a year or so to screen them for antibodies. And importantly, he screened people whether they, they had capacity to consent or not. If they were incapacitous, he got consultee agreement. And if he couldn't find a consultee, he, he, he screened them and then asked for consent afterwards. So in, in that way, he got a very high portion of people on the wards, including on the PICU, 
um, to be screened. And he found six patients who were positive for antibodies. And these are the um, little vignettes of the case histories there. But I've heard them present these data, and each one of these, they were the most unwell patients. None of them had capacity to consent to research, and they were all on it, most of them, I think, on psychiatric intensive care units. So they were given various diagnoses that I'm sure you recognize attributed to the substances they were taking, or just called schizophreniform or first episode psychosis. Very kind of typical presentation. Um, with nothing particularly to stand out as being anything abnormal, apart from perhaps the confusion in case one and case two, but, uh, and case three. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, you know, not out of the norm for what um, you see. Um, uh, number three, you know, that the young patients, uh, two 16-year-olds and a 13-year-old amongst the group, so they were found to have um, antibodies. The first four had an MDA receptor antibody, patient five had potassium channel antibody, and patient six had unknown antibodies. So their serum stuck to the neuronal cultures, but they couldn't identify what it was. Now, I really want to highlight this because the first two patients had a seizure. Again, not completely unheard of for patients to have seizures on antipsychotics, but the diagnostic test that was really important was the, the lumbar puncture. So in, on the lump puncture, you see the first five patients had um, inflammatory CSFs. Um, the other investigations were partially helpful. EEGs are quite helpful. MRI, not helpful. They were normal look in the, in the five patients that um, it was done. Um, but the lump puncture, even on acutely psychiatrically unwell patients, was important to diagnostic. So they were treated. They were diagnosed with a teratoma in the first two patients, or they were given steroids and IVIG, um, and they recovered. So these patients responded. Again, of course, it's not controlled. They might have got better anyway. But you kind of think they were given a different diagnosis, a different treatment approach, and they responded to that treatment. So these are patients, there's no reason to think they're not exactly the same as the patients you're seeing in your practice. Okay, so this is what I suggest you do. I think in all patients with acute psychosis, with the first episode of psychosis or a relapse, these patients with abrupt onset illness, you need to test for NMDA receptor antibodies as a minimum. They can go on a clinical immunology request form from anywhere in the country. If you get um, a positive antibody test, well, if you have a high suspicion, I would say, even if you haven't got the antibody test back, the useful investigations are particularly the EEG and the lung puncture. I know it's difficult to do, but that's really important. If you get positive results to those investigations, then that patient needs to be transferred to neurology and treated urgently. They might have a life-threatening encephalopathy. If they have positive antibodies and the other investigations are negative, we're in uncharted territory. I would say you should still refer them, or I don't mind being contacted. Um, but people were still in a sort of equipoise, really, as to whether these patients require treatment or not. Okay, so I'll stop there. I think that the take-home messages are, I think, that there's a clinical overlap in the presentations of these two disorders of encephalitis and schizophrenia. We think a proportion, a low proportion, but, you know, a significant proportion of patients with psychosis have these antibodies. They look a little bit different, they have an abrupt onset to illness and they don't get better with antipsychotics, but otherwise they don't look clinically very distinct. And they may respond to treatment in a very different way with immune treatments rather than antipsychotics. And my bold statement at the bottom, I think psychiatry needs to reclaim the brain. There you go. I must acknowledge you.